Hello everyone, this is Tom Simmons and we're making this video today as a brief introduction into the management pioneers, the historical management pioneers. And we're going to be looking at seven of them. And I've said modern, but in reality, every one of them lived in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And yet the concepts and the ideas they came up with are still incredibly relevant for us today. Now, the reason that this period of time generated such an interest in management is because we had just gone through an industrial revolution. And that seriously changed the way that people went to work and worked. We went from a largely agricultural society, or a society where many people worked for themselves, uh, whether they were iron workers or coopers who built barrels or printers, into a society where people were urbanized. And rather than deciding to uh, go into their own business or rather than raising their own crops, they went somewhere else to work. They left their home. They had a time schedule. Instead of doing many different tasks, they were assigned to a single task or a single type of task on an assembly line um, or with a group of other people. This created major social upheaval in the workplace, and it meant that those in charge of those workplaces, those who were overseeing and managing hundreds, maybe even thousands of employees, found themselves in a situation where they needed to figure out how to do this, and none of this had, had existed before, unless you were, let's say, in the Army or the Navy, uh, or working in a, in a slave type situation, there was no serious thought to managing employees. And so these seven people, these seven ideas that we're going to be looking at are important for, for three reasons. First, be, first, because in this course, almost every topic we look at is going to harken back to one of the theories that these people uh, developed. Second, if you go on in your studies, if you go on to a four-year school, if you go on to take additional management courses, the names we talk about are going to be, they're going to come up over and over again. People will constantly refer to these pioneers because they were so influential in the field of management. And the third reason, I'm actually not going to give to you now, I'm going to wait until the end of, uh, of this video before we, we, we return to it. It'll make a little more sense at that point, I think. So the first pioneer we want to look at is Frederick Taylor, who is considered the father of scientific management. And uh, his experience, frankly, was bumpy and not a good one. He was a steel worker, and he worked with all the rest of the guys uh, making steel. And he was promoted to a position of management. And the very first conflict that arose was the fact that he had been one of the guys. Now he was the boss. And unfortunately, having been one of the guys, he knew that many of the men working at the steel mill were holding back on efficiency and holding back on production. In fact, there was even a term for it called soldiering which was basically this, this social idea that you don't work too hard, you don't do too much, because if someone is a, is a shining star and does really well, then management is going to expect everyone to do that well and everyone's going to have to work harder. Well, Fred Taylor knew this because he came through the ranks. And the first thing he tried to do as a manager was to stop this this soldiering, and he became very harsh. And he would dock people and write them up and basically punish them if they came into work a few minutes late, or if they took a, a minute extra on a break, or if uh, they didn't uh, produce as much as he thought that they should be able to produce. It made for a very ugly situation. And in fact, many of the machines uh, in the company were sabotaged by the workers, and he had death threats, and it was a very, very difficult situation for quite some time. What he ended up doing was he came to the conclusion 
that there was one best way to do every aspect of the business, of the production of the company. And this is where we get the term scientific management from. And he believed that if you studied how everything was produced and what the workers were doing and how they were doing it, you could come up with a one best way. But then you needed to train each and every one of these employees in that best way and make sure they did it. Now, Taylor is a controversial figure in management, but he was also one of the first to say there has to be a better way, even if he didn't necessarily find it in that company. The second set of pioneers are a husband-wife team named um, Frank and Lillian Gilbreth, um, who decided to try and determine, well, what was the best way? And they focused on something called motion studies. Now, Frank Gilbreth was a bricklayer in his early years. And what he discovered from his personal experience is that a lot of, of effort and time was wasted as a bricklayer by the fact that he had to bend over and pick up bricks that were dumped on the ground, lift them to put them on a wall that he was building. And that if those bricks were delivered at waist height, he could simply turn around, grab one, and put it on the wall and be much more productive. And so the Gilbreths focused their efforts on motion studies. Now to give you a, uh, a very homey example, just the other day here at, uh, here at my house, we were digging a new garden. And that means we were breaking up uh, sod and turning over dirt that had never been used for a garden before. And as we did that, there were tons of rocks. If there's one thing I can grow really well here in Vermont, it's rocks. Uh, and that, that was okay because it's a place in the yard where I really wanted a pile of rocks. That didn't mean that we would dig into the dirt, find a rock, and then go walk it over to where we wanted the rocks. Instead, we continued to dig the garden, stay in place, threw the rocks into a wheelbarrow, and when we were done, we then made one trip with that wheelbarrow over to where we wanted the rocks. That is a kind of a, a very simplistic but a very direct application of Gilbreth's approach to motion studies. You do things in a way that requires the least amount of movement and running all over. I, uh, I've never worked in an Amazon warehouse. I'm sure you've purchased something from Amazon. But I can tell you, if every time an order came into Amazon, if the shipper had to walk through a, um, a shipping warehouse the size of a football field to pick up every single thing individually, that would take a lot more time than automating it or getting five things at once or having some labor obtain the goods while the shipper was simply putting them in the boxes. All a result of Gilbreth studies. Our third pioneer is Henry Gant, and Gant added the element of time management and planning out time to the motion studies. Henry Gant basically said, if you're going to be efficient, you need to have a view of the entire picture of what's coming before, what's coming next, what's coming next, what are the steps in the planning process. And he developed something that we still use called Gantt charts. And Gantt charts are a way to visualize the different steps in a process. Maybe step one takes place in the first two weeks, then step two takes place in the next two weeks. Then step three takes place after that, but because step three requires a permit or some planning or, or something else, you may have to start it much earlier than even step one. And the Gantt charts are a way to organize how can different processes be done so that everything is ready at the right time. And you put dates and you put times and you put who's doing, who's doing what when. It's a way to operationalize a plan to produce a good. Now, the fourth pioneer we'll look at is Max Weber who is the father of what we call bureaucratic management. Now, 
that doesn't sound very positive. When we hear the word bureaucracy or bureaucratic, we think of getting uh, bogged down in all sorts of red tape. But in his approach, and in the original sense of the word bureaucratic, what he was really looking at was managing by merit. For many, many years, and of course it still happens today, people were promoted in companies not because they necessarily were the best, but because they were the son or the grandson or the brother or the sister of someone who was a higher up in the company. In fact, they may have been hired in the first place because they were connected to someone in management. Weber said no. Management in a company needs to be based on merit. Those who do the best, who've got the best ideas, who work the hardest, they need to rise to the top. It cannot be the owner or the boss's neighbor or uncle or son-in-law or daughter or, or anyone like that. And he also believed in a very clear, very structured chain of command. If you are a worker on a factory floor, you know who your foreman is, and that's who you go to. And the foreman goes to the middle manager above him, and the middle manager above him goes to the manager above her. And it's a very clear chain of command, and you rise through the ranks based on how well you do. One step further, was Henry Fayol, who was the fifth manage, uh, manager that we will look at. And Henry Fayol saw the top management's duty not necessarily being the boss who told people at the bottom what to do, but as the one who planned at the top and gave vision and direction. It was a shift away from managing people to leading people to come on a journey. Now, Fayol was hired by Commembol Company, which was a French steel company. And he was hired for the purpose of liquidating it, of putting it out of business. The company had lost money, they had lost customers, uh, they had shut one of their uh, several factories down, and they basically hired him to just clean it up. And after spending some time at the company, he figured out that this company did not have to close. That as a leader, as an administrator, he should be in charge of plans that would get them new customers, that would get them new suppliers, that would look at a different way of, of producing the steel, that would look at different uses for the steel, that would change the company to basically morph with the times. In other words, adapt to changing markets. And this was known as the administrative approach to management. And that's where he saw himself. The sixth leader we will look at is Mary Parker Follett. And Mary Parker Follett, her approach was to say, it doesn't have to be management versus labor. It doesn't have to be how do you manage people and tell them what to do. And it doesn't mean you're locked in an office somewhere. What it means is you work with labor. And she, was, uh, she very strongly believed that management issues should be brought to labor so that both sides could find a way to compromise and to move forward where efficiencies were needed within the company. Then the last pioneer we're going to look at is Elton Mayo. Elton Mayo was responsible for something called the Hawthorne Studies, which took place at Western Electric. And it might be one of the most interesting set of, of labor management studies um, ever conducted. What they decided, and they, they really were, were piggybacking on Mary Parker Follett, they took their teams, they took their, their labor, and they divided them up into teams that were very separate. And they talked to them, and they said, what would make this work better? W would better lighting help? Would soft music help? Would chairs help? Would additional labor help? Would higher pay help? And, and they implemented all of labor's ideas 
with some groups of, some teams of labor. With the other teams, the control teams, they didn't implement those changes, but they did constantly go and listen to them and talk to them and let them know that they were part of a, a, an experiment to see where this was all going. At the end of the Hawthorne studies, one of the things they found was that the, the team of labor uh, who received the perks and the assistance and the attention that they wanted, their productivity was much, much higher than it was before. Then they looked at the other group, uh, the other team of labor, and looked at their work and this is the team that didn't get what they wanted. Their productivity also increased at great rates above what was happening before, which left everyone scratching their heads. We did this great experiment. We thought if we, if we really worked with labor and gave them what they wanted, uh, that would make them the, the more productive team, and instead everyone was more productive. The conclusion of the Hawthorne studies was twofold. First, it's not necessarily that labor gets what they want that makes them more productive. It's that they actually feel like they're being listened to, even if they can't get what they want. It was the constant interaction uh, between management and labor that gave them a sense of pride in what they were doing, and actually help them become more productive. But secondly, and this is probably the most important conclusion of these studies, and it wasn't what they were looking for to begin with, was that group and unit cohesion was more important in productivity than anything else. In other words, the group, the team, felt special. They were a unique group because they were part of this experiment. And that created a bonding between the workers. They liked each other. They worked together almost like a family as opposed to a team. And that is what increased their productivity. So that brings us through our seven uh, management pioneers. And their ideas and their concepts, as I said, are going to follow through uh, to many things that we're looking at today and many issues we're looking at today. However, I said in the beginning of this video that there was a third reason I wanted you to understand these pioneers. And that's because every one of them was responding to a revolution in their time, the Industrial Revolution, as to what the workplace looked like. You are now in that revolution. It's been 150 or so years since we had the Industrial Revolution. We are now in a technological revolution. You are purchasing services from GCC by being in this course, and you're probably not at GCC. I am an employee of GCC. I'm being paid by them. I'm not at GCC. We can do this entire transaction and never step foot on the campus. That's a technological change that is revolutionizing many, many workplaces today. Not just colleges, but anywhere. People do their work on a laptop or a tablet or on their phone, from a beach, from a vacation, from, from anywhere. People work on documents together, not because they're sitting in a conference room, but because they're using Google Docs or some other application that enables them to read and edit and change documents they need for work. That technological change is revolutionizing the workplace and it means that management techniques for efficiency, for production, for making sure that the business uh, does well and is competitive and survives and thrives, all of those changes mean new management techniques will need to be developed and new theories will need to be forthcoming. And you are on the cusp of that change. This is Tom Simmons, hoping you enjoyed this overview and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks.